Good afternoon, everyone. So today we are going to be talking about one of the most important artists of the early Renaissance. This is a man by the name of Giotto di Bandone. And Giotto is an artist who was active in Padua uh, and in Assisi and several other places in Tuscany throughout Italy. Um, and he's very well known to us as, as being one of the real important key founders of the Renaissance. Now, we've already talked a little bit about some of the key concepts and some of the key principles which really relate to this period in history, including the ideas of humanism, including um, the use of maniera greca as the dominant form, really when we talk about painting within the arts. And Giotto does some really interesting things with his work that we're going to be seeing when we look at some examples here. Now, as we've already discussed, you're going to be writing an essay today uh, looking carefully at the work of Giotto. And specifically, you're going to be comparing his work to that of a contemporary and doing a little bit of an analysis in terms of how these works are similar and how they're different. The real key idea here for you is to get a solid understanding of how Giotto's work progressed away from the standard of the time, um, how his work is innovative, what it is about his style of painting that lays such an incredibly important foundation for the later Renaissance and for artists like Leonardo da Vinci and for Michelangelo and Raphael. There are several really kind of key examples that we're going to be looking at when we talk about Giotto. And some of these, of course, are present in your textbook. And you can use those for reference for this, for this process today if you'd like. Um, but we're going to be starting today not actually with Giotto himself, but with his teacher. And here we're looking at an image. This is a painting by a man by the name of Cimabui. And Cimabui isn't his real name. It's actually a nickname. His real name was Seno di Pepe. And Cimabui actually means bull's head, which was a nickname for this artist, for this painter. And he was a very famous, well-known, well-respected painter from this period in time. Cimabui received a lot of commissions. Um, specifically to create large-scale altarpieces, much like the one that you see here. This particular altarpiece that you see by Chimabui is a Madonna enthroned with angels and prophets. Now, this sounds like a formal title, and really this is what we would use to describe this work, but there are lots and lots of examples of Madonnas enthroned with angels and prophets. This is a very popular format. And this is, again, painted in a style that we've discussed a little bit already, which we would call Maniera Greca, the Greek manner or the Greek style. And, of course, you all recall from our previous discussions that what we're really talking about when we say the Greek style or Maniera Greca is Byzantine-styled painting. And we can see that here with the flat backgrounds, with the stylized halos, and with really this, this sense of, of almost floating ethereal space around this this figure of Mary. Now, Cimabui doesn't stick completely with the traditional Byzantine formula. We do even, in the work of Cimabui, begin to see some ideas of solidity and mass and modeling of the form, and these are what we would consider to be classicizing trends as things begin to move a little bit away from that earlier style that we see during the medieval period. Here, the, the Madonna, Mary, is, is, is still placed in a somewhat three-dimensional space, but again, in terms of depth, this is really quite flat overall. So now here we have a work by Cimabui's student, his pupil, Giotto di Bandone. Now, Giotto was originally from a village close to Florence, Italy. And according to the story, Cimabui actually encountered him as a young boy. And Giotto was only about 12 years old, and he was out in the pasture, and he was drawing his sheep. And apparently, Cimabui was so impressed uh, that he uh, basically decided that this, this young boy needed to become an apprentice to him. And uh, Giotto became really one of the most important Florentine artists of this period in, in time. Uh, he was outstanding, not only as a painter, but also as a sculptor and as an architect. He's typically considered to be really the, the first genius of the Italian Renaissance. And one of the things we have to keep in mind is that when we talk about artists, from this earlier period, during the medieval time, as we've, as we've seen, artists were really just skilled craftspeople. Um, Giotto is one of the first artists that we talk about to really transcend that. Um, someone who becomes known really as one of these, you know, these, these monumental characters, one of these individuals uh, who, who is just seen as more than a simple craftsperson, but really truly as a great artist. 
So um, in this particular piece that we're looking at here, Baggiotto, we can see that he's, he's really quite uh, heavily influenced still by his teacher, by Cimabue. But um, it, it's really quite different in many ways. Some of the things that you may note are a little bit different here. Cimabue's earlier work that we looked at still had a, a very kind of flattened sense of space. And while Giotto still maintains the gold background, we get a much greater sense of depth. The Madonna here also, uh, Mary is much more massive, much more solid. We get a real sense of volume and a sense of form. And this is another one of the key ways in which his works move away from this earlier Byzantine style. The figures here are much more naturalistic, much more realistic in terms of volume and shading. And also, um, they, they overlap each other with a much more greater sense of realism. And so these are a couple of really of the key innovations that we see even in this, this early work of Giotto, is this sense of mass and solidity. And as compared to his earlier contemporaries, and even as compared to his earlier, uh, to his teacher, we can really see some dramatic differences occurring. Another interesting story, by the way, about Giotto, um, he was supposedly, uh, there's a story that, that the Pope, um, Pope Benefice VIII, had heard about Giotto and heard that he was a really talented and skilled artist and wanted to commission him to do a work for him. But he wanted a sample of his work because he didn't believe that this guy could possibly be as good as he was made out to be. And so he sent a messenger to Giotto and asked for a sample, you know, show us something to prove that you are as good as they say you are. And apparently Giotto just simply took a piece of, of parchment and uh, dipped a, a brush in red ink and drew a perfect freehand circle, which he sent back to the Pope. And apparently the Pope went, oh, okay. <laughs> and that was enough. So Giotto received a series of, of very important commissions, including some work that was done in a chapel in Assisi, Following these commissions, his fame really grew, and he became really quite well known. And he received a, a really probably probably was the most important commission of his career, and this was the creation of a series of frescoes, a cycle of frescoes, within the Arena Chapel in Padua. So, a little bit of background about this building. First off, it, it's it's really unusual in that most of the time we have a structure that's built, and then an artist comes in and paints it. But in this case. This was commissioned by a guy by the name of Enrico Scrivingi. And Scrivingi, it appears, may have actually really designed the building, had the building created around the intended paintings, which is pretty spectacular. Um, this creation was this, this chapel, the Arena Chapel, as it's called. Really, it's officially called the Cappella Scrivingi, but it's close to a Roman ruin of an arena. And so it's in common parlance referred to as the Arena Chapel. Um, it, it was created. Um, in 1303, and then uh, once it was, as soon as it was finished, Giotto's frescoes were started, and they're dated from about 1305 to 1306. It took him about two years. So Scrovengi was a banker, and um, the sin of usury, of course, is associated with banking. And so Scrovengi kind of saw this chapel as his penance, as his way, really, um, by creating this religious structure in order to kind of make sure that he, you know, got a seat upstairs, so to speak. So he commissioned this and paid Giotto to create this, this elaborate, beautiful series of frescoes. Um, here we can see actually the exterior of the building of the Arena Chapel. It's not a real large structure. Um, it's quite small. If you go to visit it today, um, you'll actually find that you have to go through an airlock, which is pretty wild. They're, they're really intent on preserving um, the condition of these frescoes. And only a small number of people are allowed in at any one given time. And you have to go through an orientation video before you're allowed into the chapel. And even then, you're only allowed in for uh, it's like 45 minutes or an hour at the most. It's, it's pretty quick. Uh, here in the next slide, you can see an example of a particularly ugly American tourist. So here we go on the interior of the Arena Chapel. And here we can see, really, um, Giotto's masterpiece. When we look at this interior. So we can see right away that one of the major things that he's done is move dramatically away from this idea, from this concept of Maniera Greca with the use of, rather than a gold flat background, a blue sky. And that's a big deal. Now, the cycle that you see here 
includes um, some some really interesting stuff. Um, there's, of course, uh, some of the typical content we'd expect to see. We see a Passion of the Christ. Um, all the way around the interior, we have um, a series of scenes which relate to the life of Christ in general, and also uh, to uh, Mary, and also St. Anne. Um, and so we have events that, that kind of span a rather extensive period. We also have over the arch, over the middle, there's a last judgment scene. There's an annunciation as well over the chancel arch. And uh, three tiers of paintings, really, which represent these scenes from the life of the Virgin, her parents, and also the Passion. Now, at the very, very bottom, you'll notice some areas that uh, look like marble, look like colored marble. Well, this actually goes all the way back to something we studied a long time ago, and that's first-style Roman painting. You may remember that whole idea of faux finishing or trompe l'oeil. Well, this is all fresco. This is all paint on wall. None of that is actually stone. And so that's painted by Giotto to emulate these types of stonework. It also includes the first known Griselle figures, which we'll look at in a moment here. And those are the um, monochromatic images at the very, very base, which represent different virtues and vices. So here in this side view, you can kind of get an idea, really, of how everything is organized into three tiers with the Griselles and the faux finishing below. Um, the figures, by the way, they look massive just because of the way he's handled this, but in fact, they're about half life size. So as I mentioned, it's, it's, it is you know, a fairly large scale set of frescoes, but again, um, they are uh, you know, not on the same kind of scale that we'd be talking about if we were looking at, for example, the Sistine Chapel in Rome. So here is another one of our key works and probably one of the best known and most important of all of Giotto's fresco paintings from within the, uh, the Arena Chapel, the Capella Scrovengi. So this is uh, a well-known scene, a scene that we've, we've, we've talked about and looked at before in earlier context. This is a scene of lamentation. This is essentially Christ after the descent from the cross. Now, he, Giotto does maintain some Byzantine elements, and I bet if you look carefully, you can see what they are. For example, we have the golden halos, which still surround some of the key players here. We have the angels up above floating around in the sky. But really, that's where most of the similarities end. Some of the key differences here, obviously, we have the blue background and a natural sense of space and landscape. And that's something you're not going to see in earlier examples of Byzantine or Maniera Greca. Um, artwork. Some other key differences here that you may know. There's something really unusual about the figures in the foreground. We actually have two characters here who are seated with their backs to us. Now, if you think about the frontality, if you think about the formal orientation of figures in the medieval style, we would never see that. But what it does here is really quite unique. Rather than us being confronted in an almost archaic manner with figures who look out and leer towards us, instead, these figures are rotated inward, and that draws our focus into the composition. So rather than us engaging with these figures and looking at them eyeball to eyeball, we are instead pulled into the composition, and we become really, by default, one of the mourners here. We also hear, see some things here that really relate to the concept of humanism. And these in particular refer to the images, the ideas, the concepts here of human suffering. And we can see that the anguished look on the faces of Mary and also of Christ's disciples here as they surround his body. Works such as this led to really tremendous fame for Giotto. And the city of, on of Florence actually honored him with the title of Grand Master. And um, he became the city architect and uh, superintendent of public works. He also designed a massive campanile, a beautiful bell tower, which was completed after his death. Here we see a pair of griselles. These are some of the monochromatic images, which are really intended almost to reference sculpture, which we'd find along the base of the Arena Chapel designs. These in particular here represent the virtues of fortitude and the vice of inconstancy. And so these, again, these images here are intended to refer um, to these concepts of, you know, of, of things to do and things not to do, essentially, that virtues lead to heaven and vices lead to hell. So we will discuss Giotto in a little more detail and talk about some other works um, when, we re when I return with you guys tomorrow. But for today, your task, your job will be to write an essay based upon what you've read in the text 
and also hopefully on some of the information that I have conveyed to you today regarding Giotto and his importance to the early Renaissance. Specifically, what I'd like you to do is compare and contrast his work with that of one of his contemporaries or an earlier style of work. So really the question here is how is his work, how is the work of Giotto different than that of medieval painters or even that of his contemporaries? And what are some of the devices that he uses to set his work apart? So look carefully at a work by Giotto. You can choose any work from the text that you like and any one of his contemporaries. This could include Cimabui, Duccio, or any of the other artists from the period that might be appropriate, such as uh, Cavallini. Now, when you write your essay, please pay particular attention to citing specific examples and ensure that you give clear and accurate supporting details. Thanks. Have fun. We'll see you guys tomorrow.